uh, network group members which we're hoping to set up during this meeting. Um, there are guest speakers from the six continents who um, need our hearty welcome for coming from, from so far away from uh, North America, South America, China, uh, Australia, South Africa, and we're very lucky to have such distinguished people um, coming to visit us on our campus. Um, and of course then there's most of you here um, who have come who are not part of Cost Action the ES1104, but have shown considerable interest in what we're, or what this conference is all about. Um, and uh, we, we welcome you heartily as, as well. And uh, one thing I just need to tell you that I know there are many people uh, being also the first day or the second day of the university term. Many people who wanted to be here couldn't be here um, because of teaching commitments and so they've changed their minds. Also, I think people who um, were away for Christmas and New Year, so um, although this hall was meant to be absolutely packed, we can see a, quite a few um, spaces which they shouldn't be. That's one of the, uh, I suppose, the problems with having a free conference. People don't, if you don't pay for it, then you can use it. But I think it's basically after the New Year they realize that they're busy at work and can't, can't take off work. So welcome all of you who have come here today. Um, our, our action, as you can see, is called Cost Action ES1104, Arid Lands Restoration, Combat and Desertification, Setting Up a Dry Lands and Desert Restoration Hub. And when I was, uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, when I was thinking about it, addressing this conference or, or uh, acting as uh, the chair for this conference, I heard this wonderful program on uh, BBC Radio 4 about the Blue Marble. And of course, we all know the Blue Marble. Uh, we don't probably know this image, but we know the image of 1972. And they were talking about the astronauts of Apollo who went up there and for the first time took a photograph of the Earth from space. And I thought, what a wondrous thing that is. And we, we realized, I think we all realized from this, these photographs, the blue marble, how fragile our planet is. And people have been working to try and adopt measures um, to, to uh, keep our planet in its pristine condition and to stop the destruction that's happening. And of course, Destruction does happen, and land degradation does happen, um, and desertification does happen. And as far as our action is concerned, there are, I see it as being too wise, and I apologize to our members who have seen these slides and probably ones too often. But they are the big whys and the, and, the, and the action why. And first of all, the big why, and this is one of the big whys. We're not talking about restoring deserts that are already there. We're talking about restoring the restoration of arid lands or marginal lands, etc. The places that have been degraded and so it doesn't support people or, or any other kinds of, of life as well. And of course, this is the big why. This is, of course, a dramatic picture, but in, in extreme circumstances, this is what happens with land degradation. And we also feed it in Europe, and this is why the cost as part of the European funded action is interested in this as well, because we have problems with migration from the Sahel and other regions. We can actually see the sand migration coming from the Sahara, but it's people migration as well. And those people are not coming to Europe because um, they just wouldn't really want to come to Europe. They're in desperate situations. Their lands have been degraded, they can't farm anymore, they end up in a, in a city, let's say, somewhere, they can't make a living and end up coming to Europe in, in hard times. Um, and of course, the effects of desertification are not happening just in the, in the far-flung regions of, of the Earth, in Africa, um, in South America, etc. It's happening on our doorstep, in, um, especially along the northern Mediterranean coast, um, in Spain, and these are images from some of our colleagues. Uh, we can see here that the, the semi-arid lands and the uh, are, are, are spreading in, in, in Portugal, which is kind of dry. And of course, I don't have pictures of Italy and Greece and Turkey and, and, and Romania, etc., but it's happening in those areas as well. So why does our action exist? Our action exists because, as a consultant and as a researcher, I found it extremely difficult, and many people have as well, to find information about um, responding to desertification. And I think the information is there many, in many cases, but it's isolated, it's kind of insular, closed. Um, there, there also appear to me to be limited connections between people working in different fields. Um, hydrologists seem to work with hydrologists, I think hydrologists and soil scientists work together, but <coughs> often the cases they don't necessarily work with 
uh, other people, economists, religious, etc. So it's a way of bringing a whole group, a holistic group of people together. So limited connections, also limited connections between practitioners, consultants, and researchers. And there is amazing expertise, of course, in Europe as well as around the world. And Europe could be a focus for leading the world in, in, in this because we have consultants, people working, researchers and academics working all around the world, um, with, with, of course in conjunction with other local people as well. So the idea is to create this, this font or this uh, place of knowledge to connect and store it, but also to um, make it available, which is very important and also to respond to new challenges and to instigate and facilitate new research, which is one of the things we're going to be discussing in our meeting tomorrow. So, uh, this is our, I call it the holistic crew, or we could call them the miscreants, or whoever they are. Some of them here you'll recognize. Um, this is from our second meeting. I, I actually put this up here as well, is because I just wanted to introduce to, uh, this is uh, Simon Berkowitz, who's actually going to be the co-chair to, today. Uh, he's sitting in front here and he's going to help me with starting off uh, questions and asking questions. Uh, but, um, yeah, welcome to you, to you all. Okay, so the Desert Restoration Hub really is, is, is about practical solutions. Uh, it's also about the science. We're bringing to the practical solutions about uh, establishing, establishing vegetation, but also about, of course, managing it for long-term uh, benefits for ecology, landscape, and, and wildlife. Um, as part of this action, we have the thing called the Desert Restoration Hub, which is the website which we're using to um, uh, store our, our information, put information, and act as a blog. And this is www.desertrestorationhub.com. And um, one of the things I put the slide up was as well because part of this action, which is very important, and a key part of it, is about education and research and getting people across Europe and, and, and more extended because we can do it with Australia, South Africa, Argentina and, and elsewhere, um, getting people involved in training schools, so the cost will pay for a certain amount of funds for, for training schools where people can go to a particular country as a group and do some certain kind of research or, or learn some new techniques which they wouldn't be able to use at, uh, do at their own university. And there's also the thing called short-term uh, uh, short-term sustainable scientific missions, which uh, Simon is also in control of. Um, and um, we, for example, our first one has happened between uh, uh, Vera Fira went from the Algarve in Portugal to Switzerland uh, in, um, in Bern and did some work there as well. And we're hoping to grow that as well. Okay, so that's basically, I'm going to be able to talk to you very, uh, during the day. Uh, we have a couple of tea breaks, we have uh, lunch, we're providing lunch, of course, for our management committee members. I'm sorry that our budget doesn't extend to providing lunch for, for everybody. But um, when I was thinking about finding a celebrity or somebody um, with some clout to kind of help me with the opening of this uh, conference and our meeting, um, I actually invited one of the ministers of the environment, and of course they've got um, you know, better, things, better things to do, and it was probably too late notice. But I noticed that Dr. Nick Middleton was, uh, was coming to the conference, and he's, as you can see, he's from the University of Oxford. And most of you in the UK would know Nick from um, his TV series on, I think it was Channel 4, um, and um, delight, delightful programs. But there's a, a, a very serious side to Nick, um, Nick's research, and he's been involved in, in desert research uh, for many a year. And I'll just read a little bit from um, the website there. It says that Nick Main, Nick's main research interest is, the, is in the nature and human use of deserts and their margins, environments, commonly referred to collectively as drylands. His publications in this area include The Forgotten Billion, uh, Millennium Development of Gold Achievements in the, in the Drylands. And this is one of the latest books uh, or publications. In fact, I think it is available on the web for in a PDF form for free, so you can download it. But Nick's been involved in uh, arid lands and the uh, response to desertification, etc., for a very long time. Um, you can see the list of his publications, and there are many more. And so I'm very happy that Nick has uh, agreed to give us a, a, a five minute uh, talk and discussion about uh, his take on. Um, 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 what's happening in terms of desertification and, and uh, what's happened over the years. So thank, thank you, Nick. 
Hello, good morning. I'm the uh, warm-up panel, if you like. Uh, I've only got five minutes or so, and we're running late already. So um, Ben's asked me to start by saying a few words about what inspired me to uh, be interested in dry land. And the answer to that probably applies to many people in this uh, room, was my university tutor, uh, Andrew Cowley, whom many of you will uh, know. He was my tutor in the 1980s, sent me to North Africa to do uh, an undergraduate dissertation, and subsequently went to several other dry lands to do my doctorate. Uh, I'm born and brought up in this country. I'm a, a mid-latitude man, if you like. And um, I'm not afraid to say that the, the attractions of drylands for me were the very different environments, the wide open spaces, the exoticism for me, and the feeling in many of them of being at a frontier, on the edge, both ecologically speaking and from the point of view of society. And that fascination has continued uh, while I'm wearing my academic hat. Uh, I also wear other hats in, in other lives. I'm a travel writer and documentary filmmaker. And throughout uh, my career, deserts and dry lands in general have held a special place for me. Uh, ben asked me to, to uh, highlight a few of the changes that I've seen since I've been working uh, on dry lands. And I've noted four main areas, and sure there are many others, but here are four areas that uh, come to my mind. Uh, one is on terminology. I, I've lost count of the number of times I've written that desertification as a word, as a term, was first used in 1949 by the French forester Aubreville. Um, but now, for, for those of us who are interested in the origins of the word, um, it's been traced uh, further back still by Diana Davis um, to the mid 19th century, and not in West Africa, but in Africa north of the Sahara, but still French colonialists. Um, terminology about desertification and the way it's framed has also seen a marked change, and it's a change, I think, that applies to several other big environmental issues. Um, well, I was involved in writing the first World Atlas of Desertification, which was a, a document for uh, RIA, UNSED, of 1992. And in the early 90s, uh, desertification was most definitely framed as a problem. It still is, but that word is not used nearly as commonly as today as it was uh, in those days, 20 years plus ago. And we've seen a, a sort of transition from framing it as a problem to a less emotive word like issue. Um, and then the word issue has given way to challenge. And now some people even refer to combating desertification as an opportunity. And although it, we're playing with words and it's semantics, the way the issue is framed has changed quite significantly and in quite an interesting way. So it's no longer purely as a negative type problem that we have to deal with, and it's become almost full circle, if you like, um, to seeing it as a challenging opportunity. The second uh, area that I've ad identified, which has most definitely changed in the last 20 plus years, is um, the agencies in, in the international and multilateral arena that deal with des desertification. When I was first interested in it, um, everything revolved around DC PAC, that some of you will remember, Desertification Control Program Activity Centre, which was a UNEP body based in Nairobi. That ceased to exist. Um, the position of desertification as an issue uh, uh, among UNEP bureaucrats is not nearly as high as it was in those days. And there's a good reason for that, because we have the UNCCD, which came into force in, in 1996. But the, the, the big multilateral and international arbiters of desertification had most definitely changed. I also 
Um, I don't remember, I may be wrong, but I don't remember the EU having much of a role uh, in desertification as an issue in the early 1990s. It is now, and that's why we're here today. Um, access is the third aspect of the issue which has most definitely changed. Um, if we go back 20 plus years, 1990 was a watershed when suddenly for researchers, certainly in, in Western countries, the whole of Central Asia and Mongolia and, and large parts of China too, I may say, suddenly opened up and became available um, for Westerners to work and do research in. And the access and accessibility of drylands uh, is a continually changing mosaic, but there are some areas that are certainly much easier to work in today than they were 20 plus years ago. By contrast, equally, some places haven't changed at all, sadly. You think about Somalia, which felt a bit 20 plus years ago, Afghanistan, um, still very difficult places uh, to do research in. Uh, other places that have, have, have certainly got a higher profile today than they did 20 plus years ago. Uh, China, there's a lot more research coming out of China than there was 20 years ago. Uh, Latin America too. Um, I remember trying uh, very hard to find people to contribute to the World Atlas of Desertification second edition in the mid 90s um, from Latin America and it was rather difficult. But I'm pleased to say that there's a lot more active Drylands research going on in that part of the world. Although there are still places where you see very little, like northeast Brazil, for example. Um, having mentioned Afghanistan, Somalia, no one uh, is researching much in northern Mali today uh, for obvious reasons, and security and, and the issues surrounding it have become one of the, the hot topics for, for drylands research in, in recent years. And that's one of these fashions that come and go, but it's certainly a hot topic uh, right now. Um, allied to this ease of access is the much more widespread use of um, <coughs> GPS and much more widely available satellite imagery, which again makes working in drylands and their margins uh, much easier today than it was 20 years ago. And actually, in, in that regard, I remember um, trying to get access to the Gobi Desert in Mongolia uh, in the 1980s, uh, when it was still a Soviet satellite state. <coughs> and it took me five years to get a visa. Eventually they let me in, but they wouldn't let me out of the Alberta. Today I'm involved in uh, a research project in the Gobi on both sides of the border in both Mongolia and China, and you can go more or less anywhere at all in Mongolia. <coughs> Uh, the final um, area that I'd like to highlight as being rather different now than 20 plus years ago is uh, in the approach to desertification as a, an issue. Uh, certainly 20 plus years ago it was framed uh, around this problem word and it was very much regarded as a, a physical issue that could be fixed technically. And I'm pleased to say that that has changed quite significantly in the intervening years. And now we view desertification as a, a, a facet of social and ecological systems combined and acting in synergy. And that's to be welcomed without question. And I'm sure that that will come through um, many of the presentations today. One thing that uh, most definitely hasn't changed uh, in the last 20, 25 years is the importance of timing. I'm out of time and I thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic to have him here today. When uh, when I when I spoke to a number of people, they said 
is Jim coming? Or James is coming? And I said, yes, he is. And then they said, well, you're very lucky because he's an extremely busy man. And I know he's an extremely busy man. He's tr I mean, I think the last trip, you, you've just been to China and whatever it is. And I've tried to get uh, Jim to come to this, co the, to this conference. And he's always been away. So I'm, we're very happy and delighted to have uh, uh, Jim here today. And uh, uh, you've, of course, got the... Um, um, the biographies are small, short, short biographies of, uh, uh, of people on the back here. So I won't repeat it, but I'll just say that Jim's, James is a, is a renowned figure, um, and he is a professor of environmental science and biology at the Nicholas School of Environment Duke University. Um, and uh, we welcome him here today and um, um, give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. two surprises already this morning. The, the first is a pleasant one, is that the clocks work, which is what I expect being at, at Greenwich. And do there's not a single clock in any classroom that actually works. So that's a pleasant. And the second one is that you were unable to get a bureaucrat to open the meeting, but rather you had Professor Middleton, which is, a, I think, a real treat for, for all of us. He's next made a, lot, a very profound contribution to the field of desertification and dry land degradation. So it's a real pleasure for me to uh, listen to his comments. My uh, presentation today is a fairly general one, but my, my theme, it, there's two parts to my talk, and my, my overall theme is that we always, we must, as Nick, as uh, Vince pointed out, we must always consider the human and the environmental interactions. Land de degradation is an extraordinarily complex problem. Hence, that's one of the, the reasons we've had so many issues with, with the terminology that's been used, the word desertification has been used as a noun, a verb, an adjective, a preposition. It's, it's used in every way, almost making it meaningless in terms of its actual usage, uh, out, particularly outside the scientific community. So my theme is the human-environmental interaction. And the first part of my talk is going to be on talking about the Dust Bowl in the United States. Uh, it's been, uh, it was an extraordinary uh, problem, and I, I think I couldn't think of a better theme uh, talk, thinking about the, the tempest here in, the, in England in that since we're talking about land degradation, it's a classic tale of betrayal, revenge, and hopefully redemption. And uh, in, in the, the tempest, there's a, a saying, I think Antonio uh, makes a statement, where at, whereof what's past is prologue. Uh, roughly, interpreted as the, is the past a good predictor of the future? The past where we've been is a good indication of where we're going. And that will be the, <coughs> one of the, the major themes of my presentation today. The second part of my talk, I will take you on a trip down to Bolivia and give you another example of human environmental interactions. These are, are just sound bites since we have a very <coughs> short period of time. But hopefully I'll, I'll, uh, my, my comments will resonate with you. The, the Dust Bowl, recently, uh, I've always thought I, I knew a lot about the Dust Bowl, but recently we had a, a wonderful uh, program in November on public television by Ken Burns, and you can look at, watch this on the web, uh, called the Dust Bowl, and it's, he, he chronicled the, uh, one of the, what he calls the, the worst uh, man-made ecological disaster in American history. And what's really interesting, I, I read a lot about this in recent months, and since that program, I got the book and I started reading about it and I found it really fascinating. And I've been thinking of actually looking at it, this past problem in terms of current problems now that are happening, hence the past is prologue uh, statement. The, I'm going to give you a, a really quick overview of the, the so-called Great Plow Up, which is, was uh, the wheat boom in the United States, followed by the decade-long drought, and how all these Social, economic, and ecological factors, inter and meteorological factors, all interacted to lead to this catastrophe. <clears throat> the uh, Dust Bowl took place uh, roughly in this region of the, of the United States. It really, of course, its impact was felt throughout the country, but it mainly was in the southeastern uh, uh, area of the United States, uh, covering a lot of different kinds of grassland types. 
Grasslands are much more extensive than just what's shown here. We have uh, different types of arid and semi-arid uh, desert grasslands, high alpine grasslands, short uh, annual type grasslands in uh, California. So there's a lot of diversity of grasslands in the United States. But this was the main area of the dust bowl. The Great Plow Up. Well, of course, during the colonization of the, the Midwest the United States, the, it started in the late 1890s. But in the 1910s and 1920s, it was a, a very unique time because the climate was very satisfactory. It was nice and moist. Uh, the wheat prices were, were skyrocketing. World War I was happening. So there was a great market for all this. And there was one of these classic booms where and a lot of speculation went on. And of course, we all know about bubbles. In this case, it was a land bubble. So because of this, it was a catch-22, or, or actually a, a, a positive feedback. More and more land was plowed under to try to take advantage of this. And there is, what's really important to understand is, is the mindset of the people in the country during these days. There was this concept that free enterprise in particular was this industrial revolution and this a capitalistic approach in the United States was something to really take advantage of. And as a result, there was a lot of compromising of con basic conservation principles. There were people who came in, they called them suitcase farmers, you know, absentee landowners, people who didn't really care about uh, long-term sustainability, but rather just to make a quick buck. And even many farmers who had heretofore always conserved, were very careful about the sustainability of their land, the resilience of their land, basically decided to make a quick buck as everyone else was doing it. And these types of, this type of mindset really prevailed during these years, and it led, in part, to the problems that, that we see. It's really interesting, I, I found this quote from the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Soils. The soil is one indestructible, immutable asset that the nation possesses. It's a resource that cannot be exhausted. It just can't be used up. This was in 1909. And I'm sure there's people today who would say the same thing. Well, as I said, a boom and then bust. The, the idea, what happened here was, of course, a big, great depression happened. I was talking about in the early 20s, moving on, all these perfect conditions for, for the boom, for the, the low. The Great Depression happened, the market collapsed, a lot of land was left abandoned, uh, people no longer could uh, afford to farm, there was no market for, their, the, the, for the wheat. And then of course combined with the environmental aspects of the, in this case the drought of the 30s, led to this human ecological disaster. It's a much more complex story than this, but these are sort of the, the headlines of what led to this. So it's a combination of economic, social, ecological, and uh, made a logical factor that all led to this disaster. And a lot of very, the human <laughs> system mainly had a major role in, in this uh, issue. Now some of the, the well-known photographs and so forth uh, are things such as the, the dust storms in the Texas Panhandle, the uh, dust storms that were extraordinary in terms of their scope and how they impacted human health and uh, people could not even shake hands because of the dryness of the air. This, they, because they would have static electricity, they, would, they couldn't even do that. It was uh, really quite a unique time. And I will point out right now that in 2012, we had the second worst drought since the 1930s in terms of uh, many different parameters involved. And obviously this led to, uh, as Vince pointed out, a lot of people uh, in the United States, in this case, migrated to find, uh, just to survive. And hence the, the novel by Steinbeck, The Grapes, uh, Grapes of Wrath, uh, came out of this. And a lot of people moved to California uh, from all over the, the United States, but largely from the, the Dust Bowl region. And I mentioned that the dust storms, uh, not only did it affect their local area, but of course, as we know, dust storms really have a huge impact in many, many areas. And it wasn't until they started impacting the Washington, D.C. area that, <laughs> that the government really started recognizing the extent of these problems. And I think that's the case also in Beijing because of the, 
the, the dust that hits Beijing now, I think that's really motivated the government there to throw a lot of money at this problem, foolishly in many cases. So, what is to come? This is a story, uh, a bit of a cautionary tale, as a matter of fact, about